In this video, we'll talk about how to find the exact area under a curve with the limit of Riemann sums. So I'm going to begin by drawing a picture. So I'll draw some axes, and then I'll draw a curve, which I'll call y equals f of x. And I'm going to label some interval here from a to b. So we've seen how to estimate the area under a curve over some intervals. And that's how I'm going to start. So I'm going to use n rectangles. This is going to be some arbitrary number of rectangles with right endpoints. So I'm going to split up my interval into some pieces. I'm going to split it up into some pieces, and let's use right endpoints. So I'll draw the first rectangle for maybe first two slowly, and then I'll do the rest very quickly. So in the first interval, subinterval, the right endpoint is here. I'm going to draw up until I hit my curve, horizontal in for the top, and then a line down for the other side. And the next subinterval, here's the right endpoint. So I draw a line vertically till I hit the curve, then a horizontal line for the top. And now the rest, I'm going to draw quickly. Alrighty, so we've drawn in these rectangles. Now I want to label these tick marks. So where the A is, I'm going to label this x subscript 0. So by the way, when we write x subscript 0, it's convention to pronounce this x naught. And the word naught I think it's just an older English word that means zero. Okay, and if I keep going like this, then I'll call this next tick mark x1, and then x2, x3, all, all the way until I get to b, and that'll be xn, because I'm using n rectangles here. Okay, so now I need to know the base of each rectangle. And we've given a formula for that before. Remember the formula for this, we've called this thing delta x, We've called this thing delta x. Our formula for delta x is you take the length of the whole interval, which is b minus a, and you divide that by the number of rectangles, the number of pieces you're splitting it up into, which is n here. OK, so doing that, I can write down a formula for the areas of all these rectangles added together. And remember, my notation is I write r for right endpoint, and then I write the number of rectangles as a subscript, which is n here. So for the first rectangle, that area, the base is going to be delta x. The height is going to be f of x1. I'm plugging the right endpoint x1 into my function to get this y value, which will represent the height. For the next rectangle, the base is delta x, and the height will be f of x2. And then I'll keep going like that. So I'll get a plus dot 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 plus delta x times f of xn for the last rectangle. OK, I can, this is a sum. And I can write this in sigma notation. In sigma notation, this would be the sum. I'm going to introduce some, some variable for my index of summation. Like maybe I'll call it i. OK, and I'm going to go from 1 to n, because I'm summing n terms. And what's going to be my general formula? That if I plug stuff like 1 and 2 and 3 up until n into it, I would get this sum. Well, it would look like delta x, and then f of x subscript i or i is my index. OK, because if I plug in 1 into this, I'll get the very first term. If I plug in 2, I'll get the second term. And if I keep going and I plug an n into it, I'll get the last term. All righty. We've alluded to the fact that, OK, this estimates the area. If I want to get the exact area, because right now I just have n rectangles. If I want to get the exact area, we need to take a limit and let the number of rectangles, which is n, go to infinity. So we got to take the limit as n goes to infinity of rn. So this is going to be the limit as n goes to infinity of delta x. Oops, sorry. It's the sum as n goes to infinity of the sum from i equals 1 to n delta x times f of x sub i. All right, so let's see how we'd use this formula or this general idea in an example. OK. so. We've looked in a previous video at the function f of x equals x squared plus 1 over the interval from 1 to 9. And we estimated that area using left endpoints and right endpoints and midpoints. Now, let's find the exact area using this limit of Riemann sums with right endpoints. OK, so I'm going to draw my function. f of x equals x squared plus 1. Let's remember what it looks like. I'm going to draw some axes. I only care about the interval from 1 to 9. so. This is a parabola, it looks something like, looks something like that. 
Okay, so I'm going to be splitting this up into n rectangles where n is some arbitrary number. So I'm just going to be writing some, a bunch of tick marks here. Okay, and when we do that, I'm going to be calling the left end point way, way at the left, the one. This is x naught, and then we'll have x1, x2, and so on. And the, n, the 9 will represent x subscript n. All right, so we have this, and I'm going to draw in my rectangles for visu visualization. And the first subinterval, the right end point is x1. So I'll draw up, then I draw over to get the height, and there we go. And the second subinterval at x2, that's the right end point. I draw up until I get the height, and then horizontal line. And now the rest I'll draw quickly. Okay, so our formula for the exact area is to take the limit as the number of rectangles n goes to infinity of r sub n. r sub n is the sum of the areas of these n rectangles. So this is going to be the limit as n goes to infinity. And I can write the sum of this, these n areas with sigma notation using this formula. So we'll get the sum from i equals 1 to n of delta x. Delta x is the, the base of one of these rectangles. So this is delta x here, this width, this length of the subinterval. And then times the height, which is f of x sub i f of x sub i. And when I start to plug in the different values of i, like i equals 1, i equals 2, the, the will then represent the heights of all of these rectangles that show up. Okay, so we have the limit as n goes to infinity, the sum from i equals 1 to n, and now let's write down what delta x is. So if, I, if we use our formula for delta x, delta x is going to be so it's b minus a, 9 minus 1, that's the length of the whole interval. I divide by the number of rectangles, which is n. Okay, so this simplifies to 8 over n, that's our delta x. Okay, so delta x is going to be 8 over n. Okay, and now I need to know f of, well, I need to know what x sub i is. So to get x sub i, here's how we'll do it. Let me write what x, x naught is first, that's 1. And then what x1 would be. Well, x1 would be x0, which is 1, plus, and then I have to add a delta x. For x2, we'd start at 1, and then we'd add 2 of these delta x's. And if I kept going like that, for x3, we would have 1 plus 3 delta x's. So dot, 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 once I get to x sub i, for any arbitrary number i down there, this would be 1 plus i delta x's. We'd have to take i of those steps to get to x sub i. Okay, and if I plug in using what I know delta x is, we'll get that this is 1 plus i times, and I know delta x is 8 over n. I'm going to plug that in. So we get 1 plus 8i over n. Okay, so this is what x sub i is. It's 1 plus 8i over n. So I'm going to plug that in where this x sub i is. Okay, so we get to plug in 1 plus 8i over n into our function. Remember, our function f of x is x squared plus 1. So we're going to plug in that into our function. So one thing that I'm going to do with this 8 over n is to notice that there's no i, the variable in my index of summation, there's no i in that, there's just n. So this is like a constant, so we are going to be able to pull it to the front of the sum. Okay, so if we do that, we'll get the limit as n goes to infinity, and then I'm going to move that 8 over n in front of the sum. I can't move it in front of the limit, because with the limit, the variable is n. So there, I can't move it in front of the limit. Okay, so we'll have this times the sum from i equals 1 to n, and now we have this f of 1 plus 8i over n. We got to plug that in into our function for the x. Okay, so when we do that, we'll get, instead of x squared, we'll have 1 plus 8i over n squared, and then plus this other one that's outside. So we have this, and now we got to evaluate this. And let's close that bracket. Okay, so we have this limit and this sigma thing that we now want to simplify and evaluate. So we get the limit as n goes to infinity of 8 over n, 
the sum from i equals 1 to n. And then within the bracket, let's square this term. So let's multiply 1 plus 8i over n with itself. That'll give me 1 plus 16i over n plus 64i squared over n squared, and then plus that other one that we got in there. Then I could add the ones to get the first part will stay the same. So we'll have that same limit, that 8 over n, the sigma, and then bracket, we'll get 2 plus 16i over n plus 64i squared over n squared. And now I'm going to use one of my sigma notation properties to split up this sigma. So we'll have the limit as n goes to infinity of 8 over n, and this is going to multiply, we'll have the sum from i equals 1 to n of 2, and then plus the sum from i equals 1 to n of 16i over n, plus the sum from i equals 1 to n of 64i squared over n squared. Okay, so we have this, this limit as n goes to infinity. 8 over n times this first sigma is pretty simplified. I'm going to leave that as it is right now, and I'll evaluate it in the next step from i equals 1 to n of 2. Plus, and I'm going to use the same trick in these other sigmas that we've seen once already. The stuff that doesn't have an i, that's multiplying the things with an i, is sort of like a constant. So I can move it to the front of the sigma. So 16 over n has no i. I can move that to the front of the sigma. It's like a constant multiplying i. Same thing with 64 over n squared. I can move that multiplied constant in front of the sigma. So that'll give me 16 over n multiplied by the sum from i equals 1 to n of i plus 64 over n squared in front of this one, the sum from i equals 1 to n of i squared. All right. So we have this limit as n goes to infinity of 8 over n times the sum from i equals 1 to n of 2. But that just means to do 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 n times, and that's going to add up to 2n. So again, this is 2 plus 2 plus, plus 2 n times, which gives us 2n. Then I have plus 16 over n times the sum from i equals 1 to n of i. This is where I'm going to use my sigma notation formulas from the last video. So in the last video, that was formula 2. That sum from 1 to n of i was n times n plus 1 over 2. So of this times n times n plus 1 over 2. And then, moving to the next term, we get plus 64 over n squared. And we also have a formula for the sum of i squared. That was formula 3 in our last video. It's this n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. So if I use that, we get this. It becomes n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. And let's close that bracket. And at this point, we've gotten rid of the sigmas. We've used all of our sigma notation formulas. And at this point, it is just a limit. And we know how to handle limits. So I'm going to do a little simplification before I multiply the 8 over n in. So let's see. I can cancel this n with this n on the bottom. And I notice the 16 and the 2 will cancel a little bit. I'll have a 1 here and a 8 here. With the 64 and the 6, I can divide both of those by 2 to get a 32 over 3. And I can also cancel an n here and an n in the denominator to leave myself with an n in the denominator. And now I'm going to go ahead and distribute in that 8 over n here to this next term and to this third term. So if we do that, we get the limit as n goes to infinity. And 8 over n times 2n, the n's will cancel and I'll get 16. And then with the next term, this 8 will multiply this other 8 to give me 64. And then you'll have times what's left on the numerator is this n plus 1. And on the denominator, the only thing that's left over is this n over here. Okay, so getting simpler. And then in the next fraction, 8 will multiply 32 to give me 256. We'll also have this 3 on the bottom. And now let's multiply that by the fraction of all the variable things that are left over. So I'm going to multiply the n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 out. And that'll give me 2n squared plus 3n plus 1 
And on the bottom, I'll have this n multiplying this n to give me n squared. Okay, so we're getting there. At this point, I'm going to use my shortcut for infinite limits. Shortcut for infinite limits of rational functions. And these are rational functions because I'm dealing with stuff like polynomials over polynomials. Remember, my shortcut was to ignore the lower power terms. So if we do that, we'll get the limit as n goes to infinity. We got to do that separately within each of these fractional terms. So with the 16, well, that's already simplified. Let's just keep that as 16. And then in the next term, I'll get 64 times. And on the numerator of the fraction, I'm only going to keep the n because the one is a lower power term. And on the bottom, well, there's only one term there. Let's just keep that one. The next fraction, we'll have the 25, 256 over 3 times. On the top, we keep the 2n squared. That's the highest power term. On the bottom, I keep the n squared. And now I get a bunch of, bunch of cancellation. This just ends up being 16 plus 64 plus 256 over 3 times 2, which is 512 over 3. Now we're almost there. We see the light hopefully at the end of the tunnel. 16 plus 64, that is 80, plus 512 over 3. If I get a common denominator with 80, we'll get 240 over 3 plus 512 over 3, which is 752 over 3, and that is our answer. So we have found the exact area underneath this curved shape. So we've actually used an infinite number of rectangles to do this. Okay, so I wanna end this video with a couple of notes and then I wanna give a definition. So the first note is that we would get the same area using left endpoints, right endpoints, midpoints, or even some arbitrary sample points that aren't either, or, sorry, any of those three, anything somewhere in the middle, which is good. We want to get the same area regardless of which choice we pick for these sample points. And the proof of that result would be beyond the scope of our class. That would be something that's covered in a more advanced calculus course. The second note is that the area that we get will be well defined, meaning that no matter what choice of sample points we did, left endpoints, right endpoints, or midpoints, we'd always get the same thing in the case where my function f is continuous. So I want to end the video now with a key definition. So this limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from i equals 1 to n of delta x of f of x sub i that we used to get the area, we will notate this using an integral, but we'll put a number a at the bottom and b at the top. Those come from the, my interval, and then I write my function f of x dx. So we form this integral. This is defined to be this area, and this is called, whoops, it's called, this integral is called a definite integral. Okay, so this is just the notation where we've introduced. Eventually in the next section, we'll talk about a really slick way to figure out a definite integral quickly. But what this definite integral represents for our purposes is a signed area. And we'll talk more about what that means in the next video. Alrighty, so I'm gonna highlight this. This definite integral is this limit of Riemann sums which represents this signed area. In a nutshell, signed area just means if our graph goes above the x-axis, that'll be counted as a positive area. But when it goes below the x-axis, it'll count as a negative area. In terms of our goals for this section, we finished goal three, to find the exact area under a curve using a limit of Riemann sums. 